For anyone following British news output recently, you will be keenly aware of the current crisis of refugees coming over to the UK, quite often in uh, very small boats and very unsafe boats. Um, this is a very difficult conversation to have uh, in the UK when it comes to refugees. So I have to confess that um, I'm faced, you know, the thought of dealing with this topic just fills me with a certain degree of trepidation. But I thought it would be worth delving into this. And I'm going to be delving into this purely on the basis of talking about negotiation and how to deal with the problem. I'm going to try not to deal with the emotional side of things. Um, because refugee is a global problem. Uh, migrants and refugee issues and flows. Uh, it's affecting many, many countries. So any solutions to address it require extensive negotiation to deal with them. So that's the part I particularly want to focus on. Um, I don't want to get too political here. And um, everyone who's been commenting on my videos um, to the point has been excellent. It's been really good, polite conversation. So this is just a little request for that to continue. Um, I know this topic can be emotive, but I really want to focus on the practical aspects. And I'm going to link it to Brexit as well, unfortunately. As much as I would like not to, the reality is, is that it's very hard not to see these issues through the prism of Brexit uh, in certain respects, and I will explain that. So when looking at why this is a refugee problem for the UK at this point in time, we have to go back a little bit and we have to go back to when it was very obviously and it was just still is really but it was very obviously a european problem and this was you have mass inflows of refugees coming through uh, countries like italy and greece you have refugees in boats dying in the mediterranean and um, it was becoming a significant problem not just in terms of numbers but in terms of the humanity of people dying in the sea and um, being trafficked um, by criminal gangs and so on. And countries like Italy and Greece very much struggled to deal with that. And part of that problem was not only the significant flows, the numbers of people, but also because those countries ended up having to deal with the problem very much alone. They didn't have European allies come in there helping them whether that's providing practical support managing support or even offering to take the refugees so what you ended up with was certain parts of europe bearing the brunt of the the crisis but the rest of europe not putting together a coherent strategy to deal with it so you know, rather than it being a problem faced by those individual countries, it should have become a problem faced by all European nations. And that did not happen because the EU was not able to build consensus on this. It was not able to create a strategy. It was not able to get all the countries to agree on what needed to be done. And I think this is going to represent one of the biggest failures of the EU um, in recent years. Um, what the, you know, the, the inability to tackle uh, that particular crisis and you know notwithstanding certain countries did adopted various policies but they were all national policies so some countries put up fencing you know barbed wire man them use tear gas whatever other countries like germany um took what they considered a more moral stance of trying to uh, accommodate those refugees to help them but it was not coherent, it was not uniform. And the UK was very much part of this. The UK can't say this was a European problem, nothing to do with us, because the UK was part of the EU at the time of this crisis. And the UK perhaps is just as guilty of many other EU countries that didn't wish to deal um, with this matter and provide practical support. And we can see the implications of that today. So in terms of the UK position uh, in relation to this crisis, there's a few things worth bearing in mind. First, the UK is geographically distant. The UK was not in the Mediterranean, so the, the effects of the refugee crisis 
did not hit the UK especially directly. It was much more indirect, and I'll come on to that in a bit. So the UK had the element of distance, um, and that perhaps drove a little bit of some of the UK's approach to dealing with the problem when part of the EU. In some way, the UK didn't really want to know and did some half-hearted attempts at being supportive to countries like Italy, but not anything particularly substantive. Uh, and that was, you know, and, and that has a bearing later on. It could also show there's cultural, culturally distant. So let's compare the UK with Germany, for example. Completely different. Germany had taken um, a quite significant number of refugees. Um, the UK, in comparison, has taken very little. And the UK is not alone in this regard. There have been other countries in the EU that have not wanted to take migrants and perhaps have been forced to, or perhaps have found strategies to avoid having to do so. But it does betray that the UK perhaps is in a certain cultural set, if you like, um, not, not particularly keen to take on refugees for political reasons. And that, that is government policy, essentially, um, which is going to be at odds with what the EU wants and what various EU nations would want of the UK. But now that Brexit has happened, the UK is now procedurally disconnected. And what I mean by that is that the UK is no longer signatory to the Dublin Treaty, for example. So when it comes to dealing with refugee issues, the UK no longer has a voice within the EU. So you could almost argue that in a market, you know, in a single market where you have free movement, that, that ability of free movement could extend to refugees, uh, and so maybe that could extend to the UK, um, allowing refugees to cross back into Europe. That is no longer possible. Um, when, when they signed up to Brexit, the withdrawal, um, that severed those ties, that severed that bridge. So the UK doesn't have any ability to send back refugees um, as part of the single market. And it's not linked to any European solutions or tackling to this problem. And it's not seen as part of the solution. Um, I've said this is a European problem. And in some ways, the UK is now cut off from that as a result of Brexit. And some people may take the view that this is a good thing. Um, that means you know, the UK has got out of having to deal with this particular failure of the EU to tackle that problem. But unfortunately, that limits your tools. Even more unfortunately, due to the acrimonious nature of Brexit and the way that has panned out, it means that the UK is politically isolated. So if the UK, for example, is deeply unhappy with over 20,000 migrants coming over from the EU to the UK, then because the UK is politically isolated, the EU and the EU nations are not kindly motivated, shall we say, to responding to the UK's requests for dealing with the problem. That's what I mean by politically isolated. And that's very much an unfortunate consequence of Brexit, which creates certain additional problems. So let's have a look at that. So when it comes to dealing with the issue like refugees and many other issues as well, there's certain levers, there's certain abilities that the UK has to influence the situation. So in the past, that would have been as a member of the EU. That obviously is no longer an option now. So now the UK has to lobby the EU for whatever position it wants the EU to take. For example, stopping refugees crossing across the whole of Europe to get to the UK. Um, you know, whereas before the UK could have perhaps driven forward a policy within the EU. Now as an outsider, the UK can do nothing more than ask the EU to do something. And the EU can very much legitimately ignore the UK. Um, so, so that influence has reduced and that ability to tackle that problem. And this is why it's a bit of a fallacy to think of this as a solely European problem. Um, it is a global problem, but by trying to pretend you're not part of the EU, you're also losing your ability 
to influence some potential solutions. Uh, and that can be seen very much in the current UK-EU relationship. But of course, the EU is certainly not the only organisation that the UK will be working with. Uh, the UN and with NATO and various other bodies, you know, charities and you know, so on and so forth. So the UK can play its part in helping to deal with the refugee crisis in there. Um, they can support humanitarian efforts, they can provide people, they can provide funding, and the UK is doing so. Whether the UK is doing enough in that regard is a political discussion, which I don't intend to go into. So by the same token, in a similar vein to that, the UK can also work with other countries. Now we know, for example, that the UK has worked with Jordan to help with the refugee crisis and camps there, whether providing you know, humanitarian food or financial support. Um, the UK can also work with countries like Libya, Algeria and so on to help improve border security, and they have done that. The UK has, can also work with countries like Italy and Greece as part of the NATO effort uh, as, a, as an ally, defence ally. However, there is another dimension, a more disturbing dimension that's recently cropped up. And that is the idea that the UK can take the refugees that have landed on UK shores and move them to countries like Albania for processing, possibly other countries too. But for now, let's just talk about Albania. Um, words slightly fail me here because this is a monumentally stupid idea. And I know there are plenty of stupid people in the world who might even think this is a great idea, but I'm truly shocked that even any UK government ministers get up in bed in the morning and think that this is any kind of solution to anything. Um, it's a dreadful idea. There's literally no upside to that idea whatsoever. And if you have any doubts as to why, I'll break this down. So we'll, take our, we'll take Albania as the current example. So for the UK to move refugees uh, to Albania, I presume by, by, by plane, um, you have to have an agreement with Albania. You can only do that with their consent. Okay? And that's the first sort of principle to establish. But then, of course, what you are doing is several things. The UK, like every other civilised country, is signed up to various conventions with the EUN. Uh, and even if this wasn't in breach of international law, there can be no doubt whatsoever that organisations such as the UN and the EU would simply look very dimly on this sort of arrangement. Um, and the countries as well, nearby to Albania, would also be exceedingly hostile to this. And you can understand why. Because effectively what the UK would be doing is exporting the refugees back into the EU uh, on the borders of the EU in the full knowledge that if it refuses their application um, for asylum in the UK, then then refugees will cross back into the border or cross back into EU countries. So, um, so the EU and you know, other countries like Greece and Italy and so on will very much see this extremely negatively. Uh, and so all that cooperation I talked about earlier in terms of working with them to deal with the refugee crisis and boat sinking and so on, all of that would be tainted by the knowledge of this sort of agreement with um, Albania. So, so there's a legal problem, there's a political problem. There's also, a, it, it, we've, we've seen how badly this has gone. Uh, and we've seen that with Australia. Australia has received international condemnation for doing a very similar tactic for trying to put country, you know, people, refugees, into third country for processing. And as a consequence, Australia gets no support, no cooperation from anyone else when it comes to dealing with those refugees. Um, and that famously became obvious when the Australian Prime Minister asked President Trump to honour an agreement that you know, that the Australians had made with Obama to take some of those refugees. And Trump quite frank, you know, flatly said no, he withdrew consent. So this is the other thing 
when picking any third country to do this processing, the amount of pressure that they will come under, whether from their neighbours, whether from international bodies like the EU or the UN, or even whether from the domestic population, who most certainly are unlikely to be happy with thousands of refugees being imported by the UK, there's a high likelihood that countries like Albania and anyone else that the UK does a deal with will at some point in the future withdraw consent. And then what does the UK do? It has no strategy. It just has a bunch of refugees that you know, can be seen as illegally deported to a third country without due process. Um, there is literally no upside whatsoever to this proposal. It's just a monumentally bad idea. And I'm absolutely astonished that it's been talked about as a possible solution. Um, you've, you really just cannot go an idea anywhere with that. Because what you've got to remember is that to deport any refugee to any country requires that country's consent. Now, quite often countries will deport refugees back to their country of origin, or they might deport them to another country that has agreed to take them. But you are dependent upon that country maintaining consent. And in this sort of scenario, when it comes to the dealing with refugees, the withdrawal of consent is highly likely and happens often. So relying upon this sort of you know, solution is just flawed conceptually. So what else can the UK do? Well, another influencing factor or lever would be France. Because, of course, France is the main country that has a border with the UK, albeit a sea border. Uh, and of course, many of the refugees that are across Europe that want to get into the UK will at some point find themselves in France and trying to get across by various means. Um, they used to smuggle themselves onto lorries. They probably still do. But more recently, they've taken to getting into small boats and have been facilitated by traffickers. Now, when it comes to dealing with France, again, Brexit rears its ugly head here because relations between the UK and France are extremely strained at this point in time. And so France has no real incentive to be nice or cooperative with the UK. In fact, France very much has its own domestic issues with refugees and immigration. That is a hot political topic for France. And you have to remember that coming April, there will be the French presidential elections. And I don't follow French politics particularly deeply, but I do know that in that presidential election, the voters will be faced a choice of centre right, more right, even more right, and even more right still. There are no viable left candidates, you know, left wing candidates at this stage. So really, at this point, the most conciliatory, cooperative president you can get in France is Macron. And Macron is obviously not a fan of the UK right now. He's also very pro-EU. So he is not going to want to cooperate with the UK and any kind of solution that's not in France's interest or in the interests of the EU. And if Macron it doesn't get re-elected as president, then you're going to have politicians who would have been elected on a, on a ticket of dealing with immigration in France. And, and this is where I point out that it is not actually in France's, France's interest to stop immigrants going into the UK. To stop immigrants going into France, maybe, yes, they can make that case. But France, the immigrants or refugees are not coming from the UK into France. So if they do end up with refugees in country who then want to leave the country to go to the UK. I'm not going to say that the French are going to shepherd them towards the border and support them over the way that Belarus has, for example, on you know, the border with Poland. But I'm also going to point out that politically speaking, France um, may not wish to put too many barriers in their way. And perhaps that is why the current political conversation is getting toxic about you know, trying to accuse France of not stopping the refugees crossing over the channel in the dinghies. Um, but this issue is toxic to France, not only because of Brexit, but also because France just fundamentally does not agree and cannot reach a consensus with the UK government. 
in particular with you know ministers like Priti Patel um, and her counterpart. They are just worlds apart from reaching any kind of agreement. And in the absence of any kind of agreement you know, or negotiated outcome, France is going to do nothing, really. That is all that France can do. So what are the choices for the UK, really, when it comes to dealing with these refugees? Uh, and I'm talking about this in a negotiation sense, so I don't want to hear any uh, or see any chat about just, you know, drown the immigrants or send them back to where they came from or anything like that. That is not any kind of solution. Um, what can the UK do? Well, really, the UK had the same choices as any other nation facing this problem. You work with international bodies, whether that be the UN, EU, NATO, anyone else. Uh, you work with other countries, you try and find solutions, you try and prevent problems, you prevent refugees um, in hopefully humane ways from not needing to make the crossing, um, whether that be through camps or internment or you know whatever. Those are the international sort of solutions that countries go for. And you have to work with others to achieve that. No country can do it alone. And no country can prevent anything alone. It's just not possible. The scale of the problem is just too big. So it requires international cooperation, full stop. That is it. So of course, what the UK can do, again, like any other country, is you can take unilateral action. You can try and deport refugees. But as I pointed out earlier, that requires the consent of the nation taking them. You can't just parachute them into a country against their consent. Um, that really, really won't work, and you really don't want to try that. That will get you into a whole host of trouble. So what else can the UK do? They can take action in the Mediterranean, perhaps to pick up refugees and drop them somewhere uh, and you know, Libya or Italian islands or something. But again, that is a strategy fraught with risk. The current proposed strategy uh, proposed by Priti Patel of pushing the boat back is another example of unilateral action. Um, but even again, it's a, it's a non-solution. Um, it doesn't stop refugees crossing. It just delays it, um, arguably. Uh, it also creates a lot of bad will with the French uh, and with international bodies like the EUN who think that the UK would be risking those refugees' lives. So unless the UK goes down this sort of put refugees on a UK overseas island somewhere to process them, it's hard to see. It's not an easy solution. That is abundantly clear. And the ability of the UK to act unilaterally is almost non-existent in many ways. Um, you can argue that countries like Poland can take unilateral action on its border. It can close the border. They can put military personnel, the military personnel can fire tear gas at refugees attempting to cross the border. That is unilateral action that Poland can take. But that isn't you know, a, a something that the UK has to do. The UK doesn't have that kind of border with a nation that does that. I'm not, not including France in this respect, that's different. So, so the only option the UK has is to work with others. And unfortunately, the credibility of the UK as an international partner right now is exceedingly low. And because the UK is not seen as a partner that has been helpful for many years when it comes to the issue of dealing with refugee and it's not a partner that's seen as taking its fair share. And for those who might dispute that, you know, the UK doesn't take its fair share, I would say go and look up the statistics for yourself. Uh, if there's a leaderboard of how many refugees you take per, you know, capita population, then the UK is exceedingly low on that leaderboard. So despite the political rhetoric, um, it is an easy argument to make that the UK is not doing its fair share to take these refugees in a, to a certain level of numbers. So with that in mind, international partners don't want to cooperate with the UK um, or very limited cooperation. As a consequence, the ability of the UK to tackle this issue is all co-limited. And this is a subtle and not direct, but 
unfortunate consequence of the situation the UK is currently in as a result of Brexit and how Brexit has been pushed forward by the UK government. So I hope you found that discussion hopefully practical, not too emotional, not too political. Um, remind you again, that please keep this uh, polite and civilised and focus more on the practical things that any negotiation team should want to do. And welcome any comments in the box below. If you wish to subscribe or to like the video as well, I would also welcome that. Thank you.